Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Jamil Anderlini, the Asian editor of the Financial Times. Thanks for joining me today, Jamil. Thanks, Rob. We, uh, we have upon us what I think you've accurately described as the new Cold War. U.S.-China relations are, uh, how would I say, quite strained. This has been a pathway we've been on for quite some time. How do you see, in your mind, why have they deteriorated? What's the state of play now? How is the pandemic that has visited upon us as we start June of 2020? And and what do we need? What are the dangers? Of this deterioration, where do we need to go to repair? Sure, thank you, Rob. Um, I would say that if you look at relations between the U.S. and China, they're really at their nadir. They're the worst that they've been uh, since uh, ties were normalized in 1979. I'd say they're probably worse than they've been since 1972, when Nixon and Kissinger made the very famous visit. To, uh, to Beijing. Um, so really what we're talking about is the worst state of this relationship in, you know, 40 odd, maybe 50 odd years. So if you, if you want to understand why relations have got so bad, you really, I think, have to look at the underlying fundamentals between the two countries. Now, of course, some of it is personality. Some of it is the personality of President Xi Jinping or General Secretary Xi Jinping, as he's referred to in Chinese. Some of it is to do with Donald Trump uh, and you know the personalities of these leaders does make a difference and is important. But there's a fundamental underlying shift that has happened that I think explains a huge amount of the uh, of the deterioration in the relationship. If you think about what uh, engagement involved and why it was so successful between the US, particularly the US and China, but the rest of the world and developed world and China, why has China been grown so fast? Why has this relationship been become so enmeshed between the West and China? You know, China's more open now than it's probably uh, been since the Tang Dynasty. If you think about it, I mean, you know, millennia since China was this open to the rest of the world. Uh, So why is why is this relationship worked? Well, first of all, China was in the mid 70s, late 70s. China was coming out of the disastrous Cultural Revolution, which followed on from the even more disastrous Great Leap Forward. Its economy was basically not able to even feed its population. It was. Uh, it was really in a disastrous state. And Deng Xiaoping in the late 70s, early 80s, he said, right, we're going to open up to the world. We're going to reform politically uh, a bit. Um, And he set the country towards what they call reform and opening up, which is the sort of great uh, change in Chinese policy to sort of embrace the world. And what happened was the rest of the world looked at China and Gradually, it took a, several decades, but it really sped up in the 90s and the early 2000s. The rest of the world saw a limitless pool of uh, labor. It saw a country with basically no environmental laws or restrictions. It saw a very, very uh, communists who were able to do business. That was, the, that was what they saw. And so you, you had this enormous shift of global manufacturing in particular, from Western developed countries to China. Uh, I think in the, in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, it cost 15 times more to produce in Mexico for the US market than it did to produce in China for the US market. And so the rest of the world decided to shift its uh, manufacturing production, basically outsource almost everything that you could to China. And it also outsourced pollution. Look at, look at how polluted uh, the West was in the 80s, even in the 90s. And look how clean, relatively speaking, most of the Western countries are now. That's because they exported uh, their pollution to China. And the Chinese people, um, 
were the ones who basically suffered from that uh, from an environmental perspective. Of course, the Chinese people became much, much richer because starting from a low base, they were able to find many more jobs. Uh, they had a huge demographic dividend, which uh, really allowed uh, this enormous rural labor force to move into urban areas and to work in factories. Now, the reason I'm explaining all of this is because most of those factors have gone into reverse. And so, yes, the uh, the personalities of Xi Jinping and Donald Trump are important. And yes, the kind of the people in the decision-making chairs at various times in the last decade are important. But I would argue much more important are these are the structural shifts that have gone, the structural uh, changes that were working in the to, to encourage engagement between the West and the East, and you know between the developed economies and China, those structural changes forces are basically all gone into reverse. China now has a shrinking labor force. China is now moved up the uh, the value chain and is producing much higher value goods. So instead of the West, particularly America, being able to sort of make the high value things and design everything and then just get it made and with cheap labor and polluting factories in China, now China has introduced much stricter labor laws or stricter labor laws. It's, uh, it's you, if you look at uh, the minimum wage in China, it's gone up 20% every year for a decade and more. Uh, if you look at what China wants to produce, it's much, much higher value uh, products. And China is now innovating. It's now, it's now doing what previously only, uh, you know, Silicon Valley and Japan and, uh, and Germany could do. So it's now coming up with things that are, that are, you know, competing with what's produced in the West. So you have the benefits of engagement and the benefits of outsourcing diminishing all the time. And you now have China as a real competitor. China's also, to be frank, used very, some quite predatory trade practices, some quite tr- predatory, uh, you, you know, mercantile uh, policies, which have allowed it to really beat some of its competitors who are playing on a more, you know, even playing field. So uh, many, 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 many industries in China are still restricted from foreign investment. Most of those industries are not restricted in Western countries, but there is a growing feeling in most other countries, driven, frankly, by uh, those same Western businesses that have benefited over the last few decades, that there needs to be more reciprocity. And so I think just to point one more thing out, that if you go back a decade, Beijing's biggest uh, lobby lobbying force in Western capitals in Washington D.C. and around and around the world, their biggest lobbyists were multinational businesses who have enormously benefited by outsourcing to you know production to China, and you know later benefited from the large Chinese market. However, over the last decade, one of the most interesting and important shifts that I've noticed and that I've observed is has been the total change in the attitude of these multinational companies. No longer do these companies go to Washington and say, hey, just be nice to China. Engagement is the way to do it. You know, don't meet the Dalai Lama. You know, don't criticize China for human rights issues. Don't, you know, don't talk to Taiwan. These, you know, all the things that Beijing uh, finds, sees as very important. These businesses used to lobby on behalf of Beijing for a whole host of things. Today, they're lobbying against Beijing on almost every issue. And the reason is they feel not only have they been, most of them, and to a large extent, shut out of the Chinese market or or unfairly treated in the the enormous Chinese and growing Chinese market, uh, but they feel like their Chinese competitors, who in some cases have stolen their intellectual property, are now coming into their own markets in their home countries and competing with them there. So you've seen a very, very real and very, very strong shift in the lobbying of uh, Western businesses. And I think, frankly, that's one of the most important changes as well. Jamil, do you, uh, do you think that the financial policies that related to what you might call modernization of the Chinese market and global integration, which 
no longer looked to be on the horizon. My sense was that Wall Street was a big advocate for, how I say, friendly relations with China when they thought they would someday bring what Americans thought was a comparative advantage of providing financial services to a very large scale market. And I don't think it's, uh, it's been a pretty rough road for them to gain access and, and contribute in that regard. And I'm just curious how you, uh, how you thought that sector was adjusting at this time. Yeah. So, I mean, a classic example, right? So who were the big, um, who were the big lobbyists on behalf of China um, 15, 20 years ago? It was Goldman Sachs. It was JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley. It was the big financial institutions who looked at this enormous, very underdeveloped financial products market in China and just were licking their chops. They were, you know, and not just the Americans, the the Swiss banks and the British banks, the Australian banks thought they were going to come in and because of their much more sophisticated products that they could provide and their, you know, their value add and a very, very primitive financial market, they thought they were just going to make out like bandits. And uh, what happened was they came in and they found out that even once uh, the WTO um, conditions allowed them to, uh, to to operate in China, that there were still all sorts of hidden regulations and hidden rules that they, you know, weren't weren't really able to overcome. And um, the I think the peak, the absolute peak of foreign all fin- foreign financial institutions market share in China was about five percent. Five percent of the entire market was was as big as uh, as big as foreign investors got, foreign players got, and they never got near that again. So you know they they were massive lobbyists on behalf of China for many 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 years, hoping that just around the corner you know Beijing would let them in. Uh, I remember going to see this. Uh, I won't n- name him, but uh, this forlorn. Goldman Sachs executive who'd been very, very senior and was sort of sent to Beijing and he sort of decided he was going to go live in Beijing and be close to them. And he said, you know, you've got to breathe the same air as your clients. He was very, very sort of um, stoic. And I just watched him get sort of sadder and sadder over the years that he lived in Beijing as it became clearer and clearer that they were never going to uh, make headway. And now it's very interesting if you look at um, as this trade war ramped up and then as the as I say, the new Cold War got, you know, really started to get underway. Uh, China suddenly said, you know, Beijing, the Communist Party suddenly said, we're going to open up and allow you to own your own subsidiary, something they've been lobbying for for decades. And suddenly, you know, the Goldman Sachs of the world, you know, the, the American banks suddenly got very excited. Oh, we're going to be able to finally, finally, we're going to get in there and we're going to, you know, it's two decades or three decades late, but we're going to get a little piece of the action and it's still worth it because it's so big. Even though China has a totally closed, ca- you know, capital account, we're still gonna, you know, we're gonna make some money. They were preparing. All these banks were preparing to hire hundreds of bankers up in Beijing. And then COVID nineteen hit, and then the real, you know, sort of Cold War is starting now. I think, and you know, they they must be feeling very, very uh, dejected at their chances. I would say of really ever. Um, breaking in to that market. Now, a, another point I would make is if you look at who's powerful in Washington, D.C. from a lobbying perspective today, I mean, no question before the financial crisis, it was Wall Street. It was the Wall Street banks. These were the people who could buy senators and congressmen and, uh, you know, who, who really had the, by far, the, the biggest influence in, in, you know, inside the Beltway in, in Washington, D.C. But I would argue that today, it's the technology companies that are the richest and the probably the most influential when it comes to kind of lobbying power, you know, the, the giant technology companies. Hey, and guess what? Guess which companies are totally shut out of the Chinese market and always have been? Google, Facebook, Amazon, uh, you know, so, so all the companies that are really the most powerful in many ways today and in the US that probably hold the, the, you know, the biggest weight when it comes to lobbying in, in DC, those are exactly the companies that China has always kept out of, uh, out of, um, you know, with the, with the so-called great firewall of China. And so again, that's uh, adding to my point that the, the lobbying 
direction in DC is certainly for disengagement, maybe even decoupling, not for greater engagement today. Yeah, I remember uh, right after the 2016 election, I was in Beijing with Mike Spence, and uh, we met with some very high level Chinese officials. And one of them said to me, I can see with all the fake news and manipulation and discussions of Russia, that your society is now coming around to a view of the cybersecurity web based uh, intrusion that we have been aware of for a long time. So he was sort of saying, uh, it, to put it in a parable, the Americans were treating Silicon Valley like a superhero and all of a sudden became skeptical in a way that the Chinese had always been skeptical. And what I replied to him, it's interesting that you're skeptical or, you know, hesitant because you went turned right around and set up your own systems. So it's not that you're averse to having the systems, you're averse to having the system that is not controlled by by Chinese people. And, and he nodded, yeah. But uh, but I think... I would I think argue that, not... Uh, mm. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, please. I would argue uh, they're averse to having systems that are not controlled directly by the Communist Party, not by Chinese. If the Chinese people were to control the internet, I uh, think the Communist uh, Party uh, would be not long for not long for the world, probably. That's their view. Yeah. It's very clear that, uh, you know... The, the internet is not um, is not safe to be uh, you know to be put in the hands of ordinary people or ordinary businesses it has to be absolutely controlled by the by the ruling party and I've actually had um, senior officials tell me that directly they've said uh, you know when I've asked them um, why they are all you know to- senior gov- senior communist party officials are all allowed VPNs virtual private networks which allow them official ones which allow them to uh, surf the global internet freely Google and you know all sorts of things news sources and anything they want outside of the walls of the great firewall and when I asked you know well how come it's okay for you to see all this stuff but not the sort of average Chinese person to to read anything they want on the internet. They said, oh, you know, why would we trust the people with this? It's too far too dangerous to trust the people with free flows of information. Direct quote from a, from a senior party official to me. Wow. Wow. Well, I guess we're, uh, I'm quite anxious in the realm of US-China relations is that I don't think unless the United States and China uh, move to a more cooperative place that the uh, challenge of climate can be truly addressed. How, how do you see both the need for collaboration and how we, could, and how we might get there in, in repairing this relationship? Because in some sense, necessity beckons us, in, at least in my view. Absolutely. I mean, if you go back to the Obama administration, I think uh, the Obama administration started from a place of, you know, we can we can deal with anybody. That was really the platform Obama was elected on. It's like, you know, there's no country that we shouldn't at least think about talking to. And, uh, you know, we're open and, you know, we're, this is this is the new America. And I think it was pretty quickly that they worked out that there was it wasn't going to be so easy when it came to China. And I think they, they quite quickly narrowed the scope of their kind of ambition when it came to dealing with China. There's just so many thorny issues when it comes to US-China bilateral, the bilateral relationship. And I think they decided to to narrow the scope. I mean, deal on various things when they could deal with on them. But one of, uh, one of the areas they focused on, and I thought was a very smart idea at the time because it seemed not very politically sensitive and not really sort of very contentious was was climate change. So, you know, the US and China got together and they really, you know, with other countries and they really, um, you know, in, in that was where they really tried to to make, uh, you know, a concerted effort for the betterment of humanity where, you know, we're going to deal with climate change. The US was the, you know, historically the biggest polluter. China is by far on multiple, you know, you know, scale of, you know, several multiples 
by far the biggest emitter of um, greenhouse gases, you know, carbon today. Uh, so, you know, you have China, the big modern day polluter, and you have the US, the, the great uh, traditional historical polluter. Um, and as I pointed out earlier, a lot of that pollution in China is actually outsourced pollution from the rest of the world. You know, you don't want to make dirty things in your country, so you send it off to be made in China. So, you know, but but without these two countries, you, you don't have a solution. I mean, it's just the scale is just so vast when you talk about Chinese emissions that uh, without China being part of some sort of deal or some sort of uh, ar- arrangement, you just and the US, of course, as well. You're just not going to to deal with this as a as a global issue. And my, I, I, like you, my great fear is that, um, you know, we're just we're talking about uh, a new Cold War where there's going to be only areas of confrontation and conflict and no areas whatsoever, really, of uh, of real cooperation. And I think it's incredibly sad. I think it's incredibly dangerous, frankly, because uh, I think. Um, not you know jur- journalists are, are prone to a little hyperbole let's put it that way um but but i don't think it's hyperbole to say that um the chances frankly of of outright um armed conflict between the us and china are, are rising all the time at least when it comes to uh proxy proxy countries proxy territories and and that's what i really worry about frankly uh, i think climate change um you know must be addressed by these two countries in particular and bringing along the rest of the world, but neither of them is seems capable or willing to, to show leadership in this area or frankly in many other areas. And they seem both to be locked in a kind of cycle of, of conflict, which is extremely concerning, I would say. I agree. I uh, am reminded of my friend uh, Orville Schell, who with a co-author wrote a book called Wealth and Power. This was several years ago, but Orville gave a presentation at a a INET event when in essence he said, given the woundedness of the Middle Kingdom, China, because of essentially from the Opium Wars through the Japanese uh, invasion at the time of the Second World War, the Chinese have a great yearning to regain the stature of their national identity at the t- at what you might call the top of the world order. And the United States, which has been in that role since the changing of the guard around the time of Bretton Woods with the British uh, handing, handing the baton to them, the United States would like to have an integrated system led by America, and what you might call a, a China that um, transforms itself to be a cohesive element of that system, but in essentially emulating the organization of America. And Orwell also brought up in that presentation that part of what was going to be difficult was not just the yearning to rise versus the kind of desire to hold on to the leadership in America, but that these two countries come from very different philosophical systems. Cartesian enlightenment in the US case and the kind of Taoist and Confucian traditions deal with many things, particularly uncertainty, very differently. And I'm curious, because you live right in this intersection working with the FT in Asia, but having been in Beijing and Hong Kong, do you think this, the Orville's large perspective, uh, how I say, contributes to that understanding of where we are and the difficulties of moving forward? Well, absolutely. So I just point, uh, I just like to say that Orville's one of my favorite human beings on earth and uh, yes. really one of the great, great sinologists Um uh, in my opinion, and uh, I, I talk to him quite regularly, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm always smarter, uh, a little, a tiny bit smarter after listening to him. Um, I, I would also point out that uh, the the focus on the environment and climate change um, uh, for the Obama administration 
uh, the first person who first explained to me what that policy was going to be and who I was intimately involved in it was Orville, actually. So, um, so he was intimately involved in that, uh, in, in that kind of in formulating that approach to China uh, under the Obama administration. So um, he, yeah, I, I agree with him entirely that you know we're talking about absolutely different worldviews. In some ways, however, the U.S. and China are quite alike in that they both have. This idea of uh, that they are exceptional. The idea, you know, the Americans absolutely believe in the idea of American exceptionalism, and so do the Chinese. You know, the, the Middle Kingdom, as you as you referenced earlier, you know, China really believes it's an exceptional country. It's different from everywhere else, and um, uh, they both also, I would argue, believe in this idea of manifest destiny. You know, the U.S. Was destined to be the sort of the world's leading superpower, and and China absolutely believes that today. Uh, and if you look at um, what Xi Jinping, from the very first moment he took over as General Secretary of the Communist Party in uh, late two thousand and twelve, in that very first speech, and I was there actually in the Great Hall of the People, standing a few meters away from him, with the other some other foreign journalists, and he. He stood there and he said, "You know, I'm I'm here to bring about the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, and uh, you know that is the China dream." He said, "And you know that's that's manifest destiny. That's the idea that uh, here I am, Xi Jinping. I'm the one who's going to bring, uh, you know, the great the great rejuvenation, the the return to some, you know, halcyon time when when." China was the dominant nation in the world. It's very explicit. I mean, we're not talking about sort of, you don't have to read tea leaves to to sort of understand what he's talking about and, and to understand the appeal to the Chinese people. And it's very interesting because he's revived in a way that was anathema to many generations of, you know, several generations of communist leaders. He's revived, you know, sort of old ideas of, you know, Confucianism, uh, old ideas of kind of ancient Chinese wisdom that that were scorned, you know, were, were actually purged uh, by Mao Zedong, and and even in later later generations of communist leaders didn't really want to talk about Confucianism. And you know, the Cultural Revolution for ten years uh, in China from 1966 to 1976 was about wiping out Chinese traditional ideas, religion, uh, Chinese, you know, traditional concepts. So. You know, it's it's uh, he's revived a lot of these things in the pursuit, probably you know you could argue of of uh, very strong nationalism, and you know American nationalism and Chinese nationalism don't leave much room for each other, uh, and I think you know that's that's why another reason why we are headed into I would argue an, a, a period of more conflict because. In the American view of the world, there isn't much room for a an ascendant China. And in the Chinese current view of the world, I don't think there's room for the US, at least in uh, China's neighborhood. So China's got a stated goal of pushing the, the America out of the Pacific. It's certainly the Western part of the Pacific. And it's very clear. I mean, it's in all the military doctrines. It's in all the, you know, many of the speeches that party leaders give. It's not a secret either. So, you know, we're talking about a status quo power and a power that wants to really shake up that status quo. And that's another reason we're headed for conflict, more conflict. It's one of the, uh, I remember uh, I used to work in the United States uh, Senate and there was a gentleman uh, named Michael Pillsbury who wrote a book. Uh, I can't remember, uh, I guess it's, it's relatively recent, but it, I had seen him speak, and it was called The Hundred Year Marathon, China's Strategy to Replace America as the Global Superpower. And it resonated with many of these things we see coming to the surface now. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a you know, you need a, you need a title that's going to sell books, right? So it's, it's kind of a, an alarmist title yeah. of, a, of a pretty well read. I mean, you know, Michael Pillsbury uh, is on, you know, he, he has a certain view of, um, of China, and it's a sort of you know it's a um, it's representative of a of a certain position on the spectrum and in in, uh, in the sort of sinologist world. But um, I think he argues quite cogently and quite uh, you know quite convincingly. And like you say, so quite a few of the things that he's argued 
have certainly uh, borne out, been borne out by actions in, in recent years. You mentioned moments ago uh, about being there at the time Xi Jinping came to power. And I remember uh, having a meal with you and your family a few years later, but not it was still, it was quite some time ago, and you turned me on to the to a museum exhibit that was uh, at a national museum in Beijing that was almost like a history of the national ascendance of China, and it was a very very striking and very strong message. And I, I was a bit surprised they let me go see it, but. Uh, oh, they want everyone to see like, it. Yeah, uh, they want everyone to see it. Yeah, yeah. But so I, I, I don't remember the name of that exhibit or whatever, but I remember was, you. Yeah, it was called the Road to Rejuvenation, and it. That's was, right. It, yeah. Yeah, that was. But it. it yeah, I mean that, it that foreshadowed that, uh, a lot. It it foreshadowed a lot yeah, of what you're talking about. Absolutely. I mean, the the fascinating for me as a sort of student of modern Chinese history, uh, that exhibition is one of my all time favorites. But just because it's so interesting and because it's so telling, it changes all the time. As you know, as the photographs were in the Soviet former Soviet Union would change when when an official would be purged and they'd be cut out of the photographs next time. Same under Mao Zedong as well under the Communist Party. So does that exhibition change on a regular basis. As party officials are purged, their photographs disappear from that exhibition. And uh, as you know, one faction or another rises or falls, so do the, the uh, displays in those exhibitions of various things that are, uh, that are associated with those various factions. So, for example, when the Minister of Railways was arrested and thrown in prison for, for ostensibly for corruption, the big display about the kind of the uh, development of the high-speed rail system suddenly shrank to a very, very small exhibition in that in that exhibition. So it's a fascinating. If you want to know who's up or who's down, you can go to that exhibition, and if you have a if you've been regularly and you have a keen eye, you'll be able to tell who's who's about to or has just been purged uh, just by going through um, certainly the more modern parts of that exhibition. But yeah, it, it tells you a lot. It, it was set up after Xi Jinping came to power. That exhibition. Its name is the Road to Rejuvenation. So obviously, it's his centerpiece. It's in the National Museum. It's a permanent exhibition. It's uh, right off Tiananmen Square, um, in the center, the heart of Beijing. And uh, yeah, it gives you a very clear propaganda view of how the party tells history and the way that the Communist Party tells history, like other communist parties and authoritarian systems over the years, is it's fluid, right? So history is a tool. For, to be used for modern political purposes. So you, you rewrite history on a regular basis in order to serve whatever your political goals are today. Uh, but one thing that doesn't usually change is that modern Chinese history always, no matter what museum you go to, no matter what the topic of the, uh, the subject of the museum, almost inevitably every museum exhibition begins with, modern Chinese history begins in 1840 with the first opium war. And there's a long screed usually about the evil British. It's always the evil British. And I try to explain this to my British colleagues and to you know people in the British government. And I say, look, you're hoping for a trade deal with China. You're really hoping that one day you guys are going to get, you know, some great benefit from, from you know, cozying up to China and you know, your Communist Party, however you do. You will never get any benefit. You are always going to be the perfidious British who started the Opium Wars and dominated, carved China up like a melon. And it's very powerful, this stuff. It's taught to very young children from a very early age. They are taught history by learning about the Opium Wars from 1840. And it's fascinating mm -hmm. because that curriculum didn't, wasn't brought into, in China until 1990, 91. And it's, it, it's, called, it's uh, explicitly called the Patriotic Education Curriculum. Uh, and it was brought in immediately after the Tiananmen Square Massacre, because the feeling was these student-led uh, uh, protests showed that the average Chinese young person was not sufficiently patriotic enough, and they needed to be, um, they needed to be taught uh, how to be much more patriotic. And so... Mm -hmm. 
it's fascinating the the um, and how the curriculum has changed over over the years. Uh, but that exhibition is a very powerful living example, and I'd urge everyone yeah. who go who can go to Beijing to go see it. By the way, I do recall there was an app for a smartphone that you could uh, almost see like the highlight reel. I don't know if that still exists, but at the time I went, I downloaded an app and came home and showed my friends some of what uh, I had seen and, and the power of the image that was being created and disseminated. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go research again whether whether that that uh, window in for those of us that are in lockdown all around the world now uh, would, would give people uh, an, another way of experiencing that exhibit uh, though it, it was much more vivid spending three four hours in there and all the twists and turns and the, what you might call the visual editorials and it, it was just fantastic and uh, so I, that's a that's a belated thank you to you for uh, for turning me on years ago. That uh, that that experience has always really uh, resonated with me. When you uh, are when you're looking at uh, the U.S. and China, I remember you, early in this conversation you talked a little bit about the personalities, but I think the structural issues that you brought up were extremely important. And in my own sense of the United States. We've talked about essentially all the companies that with no uh, environmental restrictions with a huge pool of labor could engage in foreign direct investment and be profitable. You had people imagining, envisioning, fantasizing about huge economies of scale, you know, Coke and Pepsi selling to 1.2 billion people. And you had a lot of people thinking, including Silicon Valley and others, that they were going to gain substantial market share, that the American comparative advantage would allow them to play a very profitable and large scale role in China. But even before Donald Trump began his campaign, places like the Council on Foreign Relations started making reports. I remember Kurt Campbell and another gentleman named Blackwell and others in 2014 were writing reports that could see that the convergence or the dreams of scale or the integrity of intellectual property rights were not going to were not going to get to the place that they had imagined in their fantasies. And at the same time, when I talked to Chinese officials, they could say to me things like, well, if we were the size of Tonga, then we'd send people to America, get some value added in education, come back, America would be the tugboat, we would latch on and we would engage in development, but it would cause them no difficulty. They have a population five times the size of the American population, or four and a half times the size. And so in, in some sense, they were swamping the tugboat as the momentum continued. Things like the China 2025 report, which said, we're going to walk up the ladder of knowledge-intensive industries and displace all these people we import from or uh, allow for foreign direct investment. So I think there have been a lot of structural telltale signs uh, of, and, and the other, well, there are two other things the Chinese said to me. The engine of growth in the world in the next phase is largely going to be China moving out of the middle income trap and having rising living standards here. That's where the world's aggregate demand will be centered. And I think, uh, they also said, Americans do not practice what their economists preach. They talk about free trade can make everyone better off and no one worse off, but it implies a tremendous amount of adjustment assistance in the transformation given the size 
an influence of the Chinese economy in which you might call changing the patterns of comparative advantage. And the American government doesn't do that. It deregulates, it cuts taxes for the rich, it lets people keep their money offshore. So tax evasion is now legal tax avoidance. Then they say they can't afford it. Their infrastructure and their school systems wither. And top level Chinese leaders said to me, there's nothing we can do about that, but we're being demonized. So I'm painting a portrait here of many facets of this breakdown, but I think it's deep and I think it's been there, how would I say, even before the personalities of Xi Jinping and Donald Trump moved to the fore. Absolutely. And uh, I, I would agree entirely that this is this has been coming for a, quite a long time. I, I would argue that it goes back to the aftermath of the global financial crisis, because pre the global financial crisis, I think the, you know, in China, they really looked at the US as a model, as a, as a model that in many ways that China hoped to emulate and um, economically in particular. And after 2008, I think there was a, a, rec- a feeling, a recognition that, you know, America certainly wasn't perfect and that America, had, you know, that the Wall Street had blown up um, this global system that China certainly didn't want to, you know, to copy. Um, and so I think, yeah, definitely it goes back to to back then. And and frankly speaking, I think there was a bit of uh, a bit of hubris started to creep in in China, a feeling that actually, you know, and maybe well-founded perhaps, but uh, but a feeling that, you know, China didn't want to or didn't need to copy America, that China actually maybe had a much better system. Um, and that certainly is the the sort of mainstream of the rhetoric today, at least domestically. I mean, it's not really what China tries to project outside uh, its borders, but that's certainly the message to the Chinese people. Is, uh, and you can see it uh, going into overdrive right at the moment with the protests that are happening in the US and the rioting and looting happening across the US. The Chinese state media is wall-to-wall coverage of that and saying, see, that's that's the American system and look at how much better our system is. Um, and so, you know, that that is, I think, you could date it easily back to 2008. Um, but certainly I think that the personalities of Xi Jinping and then later Donald Trump, Xi Jinping came out into power in 2012, Donald Trump in obviously 2016, uh, early 2017. I think those two personalities, well, to a certain extent, they're both reactions to uh, the changes that have happened, uh, the underlying structural changes, and and their accelerants for for this kind of more confrontational approach to the bilateral relationship. And I think it's, you know, the, the personalities do matter. They're not, they're not sort of irrelevant. Um, Mm -hmm. and I would say both those personalities have accelerated the, the, uh, more, you know, confrontational approach from each country. I'm, uh, I'm grinning as I'm listening to you because I'm remembering one of your predecessors in China, Richard McGregor in his book, the party, about the, uh, <clears throat> particularly at the outset of the book, there's a passage or, or a, a scene where American financiers come in and the Chinese leaders tell them essentially, well, you blew up Asia in the 90s and now you've blown up yourself. You're certainly not the model we're going to emulate as we build this country. And, uh, but I, I th- I've thought Richard's book captured that 2008 and slightly beyond window very, very skillfully. Yeah, Richard was my boss uh, when he was the China bureau chief, and uh, he's the one who hired me to the Financial Times. He's, ah. uh, I, I like to think of him as my rabbi uh, or lao shi, <laughs> my teacher. And uh, yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's a great journalist and a great author. Yes, indeed. So uh, I guess the other thing that uh, relates to China and China-U.S. relations that is, how would I say, very much on the radar right now is the evolution of Hong Kong. And I know you live there and 
I, I've told the story a couple times on this podcast about being in a car in uh, in December last year when or, or late November I believe it was uh, when a bomb went off in the street and, and Hong Kong was a bit like a ghost town the weekend I was there the conference I was attending essentially officially canceled and then went to a closed venue and convened there but it was not publicized and there was quite a bit of uh, protest in the streets but it's, it seems, tell me a little bit about what's happened more recently. What's, what's going on now in Hong Kong and what does it portend? What, what, what can we learn from that? Yeah, well, if, um, if uh, Hong Kong is, so if there's a new Cold War between the U.S. and China, which I believe there is, uh, we're in the early stages of it. Um, if, if there is, then Hong Kong until now has been West Berlin, but uh, Beijing is about to turn it into East Berlin. Let's put it that way. Um, this is really, as one of my colleagues put it, probably slightly more poetically, uh, you, you, you need to think about this as two giant weather systems uh, colliding. So if one of the weather systems is uh, authoritarian, increasingly totalitarian um, uh, Communist Party rule uh, in the mainland, in mainland China, um, and the other weather system is the the liberal Western democratic ideology. These two ideological weather systems are really smashing into each other over the, you know right above Hong Kong, and it's it's really causing a tempest down here on the ground. Um, the the latest is that um, next week, uh, June fourth, is the thirty first anniversary of the Tiananmen massacre, and we expect a very large well, large protests, maybe not very large, actually, because um, for 30 years, every year, there's been, you know, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people have come to Victoria Park in, in uh, Wan Chai in Hong Kong. Uh, they've gone there and they've, um, they've held a candlelit vigil. It's the only place on Chinese soil inside the People's Republic of China where, where it's, it's been until now legal and totally allowed for people to remember this this event from 1989, um, except that this Thursday, uh, Beijing, as Hong Kong government, the Hong Kong police have banned that vigil for the very first time, and they they claim that that's because of the danger of COVID-19, but that seems like a very uh, lame excuse. Um, it's clear that um, the real reason is almost certainly that. Um, Beijing is intent on introducing a very strict draconian national security law, uh, imposing it on Hong Kong, and that uh, the police don't want to, uh, and the Hong Kong government don't want to, a uh, Beijing appointed Hong Kong government don't want to uh, further antagonize the leadership up in Beijing with the possibility of, of a very large, very visible, very well covered. Uh, vigil on this very sensitive anniversary. So um, this week is going to be, I think, very important. Um, but the, the underlying issue is that Beijing, I think, surprised the Hong Kong government and almost everybody in Hong Kong with this announcement uh, very recently, just a week or so ago, a week and a half ago, this announcement that they were going to uh, circumvent, um, bypass the local legislature, they were going to effectively throw out the idea of one country, two systems through which Hong Kong is supposed to be governed and actually contravene the the basic law, the, the mini constitution here in Hong Kong by directly imposing a national security law on Hong Kong. So if we've talked to quite a few constitutional scholars and, and you know, great legal minds and it's very hard to find someone who argues that this is even legal under Hong Kong and Chinese law under the under the constitution here. Uh, but I think that's irrelevant in a sense because Beijing has just effectively decided it's going to do this. Um, I don't think anybody wanted this, even the most pro-Beijing figures, although some, many of them have come out to s publicly support this. I mean, until Beijing said this, they were all opposed to this as, an, as a possibility even. Um, I think so in Beijing's calculation, in the Communist Party's calculation, they were very, very worried about 
uh, elections, uh, tightly controlled but somewhat democratic elections that were supposed to happen in September. If you go back to late last year when these district council elections, which are the absolute lowest level of election, when these happened, uh, the pro-democracy figures, uh, anti-government figures, uh, you know, candidates won a sweeping landslide. 85% of the seats or more mm. were won by pro-democracy, anti-government. Um, so that really caught Beijing's by surprise. They actually, in the weeks leading up, had been clearly messaging that they thought that pro-government and anti-demonstrator candidates were going to win in a landslide. So this was a sort of stinging rebuke. And I think uh, it's quite clear that Beijing felt that when these elections come around in September, uh, that they were for the Legislative Council, which is the local legislature, that they might even have lost the local legislature. So, uh, which would have been much more embarrassing to try and annul those uh, those um, results. So in Beijing's mind, what they've done is they have introduced this now when the rest of the world is distracted by the virus and uh, when the Hong Kong people haven't been protesting so much over the last few months because of the virus. And uh, by ramming through this legislation, they hope that they will scare the protesters off the streets and everyone will be cowed into sort of silence and acceptance. Um, and hey, guess what? If, if people do still come out and protest against this, as they have over the last week, then they'll pretty soon have a national security law, which they can use to round everybody up. Um, there are very deep concerns. If you go back to 2003, when this, uh, when a much, much milder version of this was proposed, um, under the, actually under the, ba uh, the basic law, the mini constitution, when a national security law was proposed in 2003, you had the biggest protest up till that point, peaceful protests ever in the history of Hong Kong against it. And the plan was swiftly abandoned. And uh, the Hong Kong government, Hong Kong legislature has never been in a political position where they were able to even suggest reviving that national security legislation. Partly because, and it's getting quite technical, but partly because the legislation itself is almost certain to contradict other parts of the mini constitution in Hong Kong, which are supposed to guarantee freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, um, the free press, uh, the way that national security is interpreted in China, in mainland China, is extremely broad. So somebody who posts a poem or a satirical cartoon on the internet can go to prison for several years for subversion or incitement to subvert state power, as it's uh, referred to in Chinese law. So, you know, you, you can see the uh, quite large ramifications for Hong Kong if, well, this law is almost certain to be pushed through in time for those elections in September. And my great concern is, I mean, you, you were talking about um, witnessing a bomb exploding here in Hong Kong. I've been out many times out to the front line to witness as a reporter to see, you know, how, how these protests are playing out. And uh, I've seen them get quite violent in some cases. And uh, my great fear is that in doing this, uh, Beijing, you know, the Communist Party has closed off in many ways the possibility of peaceful protest, uh, pe closed off the avenues for people to protest peacefully and, and you know, for for some of the more radical members of the protest movement, you could see uh, the attract. Well, you could see them going. Unfortunately, very unfortunately for Hong Kong and for everyone here, uh, moving in a much more violent direction. And my prediction for nearly well for about eight nine months now has been that, unfortunately, I think we may end up uh, in Hong Kong in a situation somewhat like Northern Ireland. And uh, that will be a disaster for the Hong Kong people, for the world, for uh, you know, for anyone who loves Hong Kong and loves China, as as I do. Yes. Well, thank you. That's how I say that. <laughs> that's a daunting portrait. It doesn't. Uh, how do I say? Uh, I'm an old sailor, so when you talk about weather systems colliding. Most often, that's where you see thunderstorms and lightning, and it sounds like that's uh, exactly what's how I, approaching or upon us now in Hong Kong. But, uh, 
But Jamil, I uh, I always really love talking with you, and I learn a lot. I'm inspired to be more curious by your vitality. But uh, and I hope that we can come back on this podcast together from time to time as events unfold. But I guess for at, at this moment, I just want to thank you for being here today and encourage everybody to follow your fine work with the Financial Times and, uh, and their good judgment of making you their Asian editor. Uh, I want to applaud that too. But thanks for being with me today. And uh, we'll, uh, like I said, let's meet again soon. It's always a pleasure, Rob. Thanks. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.